girls out after parents just don't understand where I sampled pretty much the theme song. I didn't sample, I replayed the theme song from Nightmare on Elm Street. It was a humongous record. Um, and New Line Cinema, who actually did the Nightmare movie, sued Will and I. Um, and you know, we were in court. It was just, you know, we were all young, we were trying to say we didn't really understand what we were doing and it really made us feel bad. You know, we, we took the theme song and we should have. And it was funny because the judge was actually trying to side with us and was like, do you understand that these guys' records actually helped your movie? But what happened was they had made an investment in the Fat Boys to do a nightmare record, and our nightmare record actually was bigger than theirs. So they sued us, and part of the settlement was they were like, we want to give you guys three movie scripts to do. But it was up to us to accept so much. We kind of looked at it like, man, they just gonna give us three scripts, we just gonna say no to all three, and it's over. <laughs> And the first script they gave us was House Party. Because if you ever look at the principle of House Party, one guy was a DJ and one guy was a rapper. Like, they wrote that, like, this is for you and Will, this is gonna be House Party. And we were like, nope. And went to the next one, and it was like, nope. And went to the next one, and nope, and we're done. And then House Party came out, and we were like, oh, shit. <laughs> Did you guys ever um, collaborate with Kid and Play? Oh, no, we were cool with Kid and Play. We just, you know. Did that then in turn like uh, inform your decision to do uh, Bennett? No, I mean, Will already had his, his mindset on getting into television or getting into movies. That just wasn't the way we wanted to get it. We didn't really want to be strong armed and what they could have been, you know. And I, and I still, to this day, well, you think saw it was like selling out or whatever, or you just. No, you no just, not at all. But did you even not, bother to read the scripts, or you just were like. <laughs> No, we didn't read the script. I didn't read the script. I still have the script at home. Um, but you know, I, looking back in hindsight, I still think it was a great move for us not to do that. Um, because, you know, it, it's, I don't know if that was the right time for, you know, I'm not even going to say me, but for Will to kind of enter into the, the TV and the movie. You know, I think he, he, you know, everything that he did played out perfectly. His step into movies was very different to those kind of characters. Though. Yeah. It was like, and I, and I imagine specifically different from what he was doing on Ballet in order to kind of make himself a yep. serious film actor. And he apparently hasn't done him any harm. Yeah. One more. I know. I'm one, good, man. one of the best shows I've ever been to was on the Jazz Cafe, the, uh, like when Magnificent Jazzy Jazz came out. Live band. Yep. Eric Robertson, everything, everything. Um, it was awesome. Have you got any plans to do any projects like that in the future? I would love to. That was a very, very hard project. That was a very, very hard run of shows um, because it wasn't just me. It was a collection of people. Um, and then it was funny because, you know, it was before Eric Robeson really, that was his first time, you know, in the UK. So it was really before he kind of took off. creative. What I'll do is I'll mix and match out of all of the 50. Like I'll play five from here and go here and only 10 here and do that. Um, but I, I, I grew up at a time when you followed your favorite DJ because you liked the musical journey he took you on. I think what I'm just mad now, um, you know, is so many DJs take you on the exact same journey. Now, and, and, and I, there's a side of me that I can't get mad because a lot of times I get asked, what advice would you give to a new inspiring DJ today? Um, and the hard part about that is the advice that I would give you probably wouldn't work today. Because I would tell you to be creative, I would tell you to be your own person. I would tell you to figure out what your niche is. I would tell you to, you know, play a little bit of everything. I would tell you to, you know, always throw a curveball in. You know, it's, it's, to me, when people, when you play a set and you walk out, people don't talk about the popular records you play. They talk about the curveball. Tons of Africa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really love that record. And all the guys that are like the residents of my parties and stuff like that, they're always cussing me when I play Toto Africa. And then when Jeff played it on Sunday night, I was like, ah, 
That's only Phil Vindicate you, do you know what I mean? Like, if it's good enough for Jeff, it's good enough for you fuckers, man. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it's just to, to, to tell people that in a world where, you know, and, and, and especially me coming from the U.S. where, you, I, you know, I, I can't stand to turn on the radio, you know, because there's no creativity, you know, there's the same records that are played over and over and over again. Um, and then what that does, that to me is like the matrix to people that they hear these records on their way to work. They hear these records listening to their, 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 their phones at work. They hear them on the way home and they get dressed and they go to the club and want to hear the exact same records. You know, you kind of get so programmed that you don't want to kind of a form of music. Hip hop was a form of lyric off of pre-existing music. And then it turned into, okay, we're just gonna start making our own music. Um, but, you know, hip hop really started with, you know, guys cutting two copies of Good Times and somebody rhyming over top of it. Um, you know, because it was created out of meager means, you know, it wasn't people who could play instruments or had instruments, you know, we basically took our mom and pop records. Or a full, uh, like music. Yes. Um, and then it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard because I was one of the main people that were in the whole sampling thing, you know. Um, and you didn't really, you didn't understand until somebody really put it into layman terms that you're basically taking somebody else's music and you're using it. It's kind of like, okay, this shit is really wrong. You know, and, and the entire culture was based off of something that was wrong. Um, and then it turned into, okay, you have to go and get Clarence. Um, which was very weird because it went from hip hop is something that's not gonna last and we really don't care about it to oh my god these guys are selling so many records that I want to you know charge exorbitant amounts you know for people using it um, and it kind of killed a lot of the, the the hip hop element you know it got to a point that it was too expensive um, I don't know what album it was. It was one of the last albums that Will did, and we did a record called Pump Me Up that was actually a DJ routine that I used to do off of Pump Me Up that Will was like, I want to put a classic two turntable routine record on you. If you get a chance to listen to it, that record cost $300,000 to me. And he was the only person in music that said, I'm gonna pay for that because I believe that that needs to be out there. But when I realized what the tag of me just cutting these records in ended up being, I knew that there was never gonna be another clear record like that again. What were you using? Ah, oh, man, I used, you know. Was it because of the number of tracks you were using? Or? Well, no, it was just, you know, it's, what a lot of people don't understand is a lot of your favorite artists don't own their copyrights on their music, you know, so. You know, it might be someone in the background that's kind of like, hey, you know, you, you, you use this grunt sound that I know what it is, and I actually want $50,000 for these users. And the flip side of that is that there's a lot of records out there uh, that no matter how huge they are, the artists, like the hip hop artists, aren't seeing a penny. So for instance, awesome. like, most of your favorite. Yeah, we had five performing for us and stuff like that, and he was saying like, much as you guys love Can I Kick It, we as Tribal Quest, we have this fucking record. It's like our biggest record, and to date, like we still don't see a penny because yeah. everything goes to Lou Reed. Yeah, yeah. But then the breaks, excuse the pun. Yeah. <laughs> Who's up next? Hi, 